let's start. Um, so a quick agenda of uh, this uh, this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about what is software supply chain uh, because it's a widespread buzzword. I'm going to uh, give some examples of attacks happened uh, in the last last years in in software supply chain, how it's connected to AI and what's coming up in the future. I'm going to recommend some takeaways uh, and pretty much that's it. Plenty of examples. Feel free to if you if you have any questions uh, to type it in the chat. I'll find some time uh, uh, to to answer questions. So uh, I'll start by. I thought about starting by uh, giving the official uh, uh, introduction as I do in conferences, but as you uh, JetBrains uh, guys are such a cool guys, and uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a disclosure. I'm using this IDE for, I think, more than 10 years, your uh, family of IDEs. So it's a great honor to, to give a presentation at your conference. And I decided because I'm a bit of a crazy person, I decided to give you the not important facts about me because it's like it's boring. I did that and this, and I'm coming from this background. So, uh, fact, not important fact number one about me: I grow hot peppers and I set up a community in Israel where I live of hot peppers, crazy people like me. Uh, this is from uh, a picture of a contest we made. Uh, so uh, I, I survived a couple of rounds, but I didn't win. But I, I super uh, passionate about hot peppers. I even carry one uh, small bag in my wallet. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a crazy fact. Uh, unimportant fact, crazy fact uh, number two, I do this crazy people sport. I keep injuring, uh, but it's super fun. And I'm riding these dangerous vehicles, uh, Ducati motorcycles. Uh, so um, I even joined the motorcycle gang. Uh, and uh, last, uh, not important fact, I, I have some crazy thoughts from time to time, and I like to translate them to a t-shirt. So uh, obviously, P equals NP is incorrect, but it's, it was fun to wear it in the office and, and see some, some folks. Uh, whoa. <laughs> uh, and in, in Hebrew, uh, it says a good uh, developer is a lazy developer, but hold your horses. Efficient, uh, uh, lazy type, not like lazy, lazy type. All right, so <laughs> that's a bit about me. Uh, let's talk uh, about the topic of the presentation, uh, software supply chain. Okay, this is, I, I'm sure you heard of this term. Uh, basically, it's a process of, uh, of developers contributing code into source control, build component compiles the source control into um, uh, an artifact, this artifact is hosted somewhere, maybe uh, uh, artifact server, maybe CDN, and then consumed by something, maybe a human being or other software component. That's like the life cycle in a nutshell of how we create software. So this process of, uh, of software creation, or if you say software supply chain process, uh, if an attacker, a threat actor gets doesn't matter where into this process uh, that could affect heavily critically uh, of the end result for instance if our uh, authentication token uh, for the source control is is leaked and threat actor take advantage of it uh, that could be used to create uh, um, commits or contribution by threat actors possibly without us paying attention. Or if uh, we're using some random dependency and that dependency is uh, contributed by threat actors, as I'm going to show you plenty of examples, uh, that's going to affect our end artifact, our build component is building. Or if our build server is, in, is using some plugins from the open source community and those plugins look okay but actually behave badly that's going to affect our software artifact so uh this uh, strength of of this chain uh, uh is is measured by the weakest link i would like to to mention uh check marks uh and jet brains are uh 
had previous successful projects. Uh, one is to integrate into the IDEs uh, vulnerability data free of charge, uh, I think starting two years ago. So uh, let's let's do more things together. I think uh, we have uh, the, the goal of doing good for the community. And I'm leading a research group at Checkmarks, and my team's mission is to fight bad guys, fed, uh, fight uh, supply chain attackers. Uh, we do that by monitoring the entire, let's call it, ecosystems of um, packages, uh, NPM, Nugget, uh, Maven, etc. And every new contribution is being uh, scraped and collected and indexed and then analyzed. And if something is suspicious as bad, uh, we're not looking, my team is not looking for uh, vulnerabilities, but for malicious contributions from malware. And if something is suspicious as malware, we have analysts that do manual review. And then if it's not false positive, we report it to the security uh, admins of NPM, of PyPy, of Maven, etc., uh, and write blogs about it uh, and let the community know. We helped create a standard recently, uh, collaborated with Google. Uh, this standard is to classify and identify malicious packages. So this is from a free project called osv.dev uh, for auditing all kinds of problems in packages. So the MAL uh, class, uh, we helped creating it. Um, so that's a bit about supply chain, software supply chain, um, what my team is doing. Now, stating the obvious, everyone uses open source. Um, makes a lot of sense. Makes uh, sense in the agile mindset. We want to deliver fast. Doesn't make sense to reinvent some, you know, so coding components from scratch. Um, so relying on open source, it's good for performance, it's good for maturity. Um, most of the infrastructure we rely on came from open source. So uh, it helps us create software faster. Usually when we create software, we're thinking like, okay, we're, we're, we made uh, a decision to add that dependency to our project. We, st we specified in the manifest file, depends on the context, depends on the, the programming language. Uh, but what we not necessarily always pay attention to that the direct dependency we add are bringing us surprises like side effects, other packages they depend on. Uh, it's called transitive dependencies. In real life scenarios, it can be forced and forced of transitive dependencies. For instance, uh, I know you, you, you uh, are uh, Java-oriented. Uh, most of you are, are came from Java background, but I'm going to give some other examples, uh, not necessarily from Java. Uh, so this one is from NPM. Um, so if I want to uh, go and do a deep dive analysis of what I'm getting, if I'm installing CNCJS, just a random package uh, uh, available on NPM ecosystem. I want to go and do analysis of the code, the packages, the persons involved. I want to vet their reputation um, because I'm scared. I don't know, it's strangers for me. I would need to invest a lot of time because that simple direct dependency, that single one, brings over 800 transitive packages, additional packages, contributed by over 600 different contributors. In other words, I might be thinking of creating that software co component by myself uh, if I wasn't like paranoid, super paranoid, but it would take me a lot of time to go and deeply uh, cover each and every one of the uh, uh, new packages I'm getting. Uh, I think it's the most interesting part of, of this talk. I'm going to, to give you some examples. So let's start. This uh, cool guy, uh, his name is Faisal. He's from Indonesia, and he's the creator of a very compact and popular package called UA Parser JS. Uh, it's a package written in JavaScript. Um, this screenshot is from NPM. It's designed to parse user agent strings. 
and you know those browser headers uh, when you make http calls this package can parse it can give you the browser version the operating system all of that metadata hidden inside uh, it's this is the compact package created for that task uh, maintained for many years very mature and super popular a lot of people depends on it use it download it because this this business logic was created very good and you know has almost no bugs uh very stable uh on october 5th 21 we saw this message uh on on hackers firm on the, on the underground uh hackers posted this uh, uh message selling a development account on npmjs with a couple of millions weekly installations and guess what no two-factor authentication enabled on that account so they were selling username and password and they they state it's perfect for botnets miners or, or other uh creative tasks ten thousand dollars first bid <laughs> uh we know someone uh, bought this account and, and uh, attacked uh, uh faisal's uh, npm account directly because a couple of weeks after that post uh faisal posted this message saying that he's sorry uh some hackers uh hacked his npm account and published sim uh, several malicious versions of ua parser js they were able to do that uh, because a no two-factor authentication was in that account and they bought the the username and password from the hackers uh what they did to stay uh under the radar and to not be paying attention for uh for the victims uh is uh, they preserved the original code and they added a pre-install statement, pre-install script that basically downloaded a credential stealer and deployed crypto mining. So uh, this is the wallet address related to the attackers. And this is the, the uh, credential still deployed, but regarding the the users of of your parser js the functionality kept working they, they didn't change the code only added the pre-install script uh, again to stay under the radar and to uh, make this attack as effective as possible a couple of hours later npm security team got involved removed those malicious uh versions uh helped faisal security his account by en enabling two-factor authentication we thought that was over, but guess what? Two weeks later, same attack on unrelated, two unrelated packages, uh, COA and RC, uh, both combined uh, with over 20 million weekly downloads. Same malicious code, same wallet address, same attackers. Um, so it was very clear to us that it was persistent threat they wanted to deploy those crypto miners and they bought uh random uh, maintainers with highly downloaded uh, victims um uh, with user base on on the, their uh, packages they created uh, to deploy those crypto miners another example um uh, and before I give the, the, the other example, that attack technique is called account takeover. So we have Fred Actor taking over someone's account uh, and delivering malware, uh, knowing that uh, this package, this entity is highly popular. So it's account takeover, that's technique. Another example, uh, uh, this uh, cool guy called uh, Brandon Miller. Uh, he's from uh, United States, California. This is from his YouTube channel. Uh, he's riding e-bikes. He's taken to the track. He, he, he shares his experience on his YouTube. And, and guess what? He's also an uh, open source contributor. He contributed over 40 packages to NPM. One of them called Node IPC. It's for inter-process communication. So imagine you have two instances of an application running on the same machine. You want them to communicate. So instead of implementing the infrastructure in all kinds of ways, you have this package uh, to to make to simplify this process. Um, uh, it's maintained for many years, highly reputated, uh, popular. Uh, and two years ago, uh, this happened, but not as an account takeover. But Brandon himself contributed this feature. So we saw it first on GitHub. Uh, we saw uh, a new 
bizarre file added. Um, this was the content of this uh, new file. Uh, and this file executed upon every new installation. And if I prettify it a bit and make it easy to read, this was the code inside, not too long code, but um, let's walk through it. First statement is to go into that uh, free service, IP gear location. It's a SaaS service that if you make an HTTP request, it replies with a JSON, uh, giving you all kinds of uh, metadata regarding your geographic location. So in, for instance, if I'm calling this service from United States, this is what I'm getting, United States. If I'm calling from Israel, I'm going to get Israel, Russia, Russia, etc. Um, and then it checks if it's a country a or country B, uh, then it's going to delete the files on the victim's computer. Now, the implementation of that delete, it's to preserve the file, but to replace the content of, of the file with a hard emoji. Now, uh, you may guess, why would Brandon do such a thing? Um, he posted this on social media. Uh, it was his take on, on a political protest. And he said, you downloaded my software for free. So basically, I'm allowed to wipe your computer. This is what he posted on, on, on X or Twitter. Uh, back then, it was called Twitter. Uh, he, he said he got a lot of downloads for it uh, on this GitHub thread. He said, this is all public, documented, licensed, and and got so much downloads. Uh, and the industry, the security defense industry, this is the first time um, uh, we, we coined the phrase prot protestware. Um, so uh, just a reminder that popular packages can deliver malware. Uh, and Brandon didn't experience an account takeover, but he self-sabotaged uh, his own popular package. But it's like a family of, we rely on popular packages. We think they're legit, they're reputated, they're, they're going to keep us safe. And I have a list that keeps updating from time to time of super popular projects that ends up delivering malware to its users, becoming victims. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, another example, uh, this is a Python package. Uh, the package on the left highlighted in red uh, is malicious and the package on the right is a popular package, a uh, legitimate one. Uh, my team researched and found the, the PAMPIO package and other than the name, uh, it's a perfect copy. They share the exact same code. Uh, except one minor metadata difference, the Pumpy IO is having a transitive dependency, uh, uh, Redupti something. And when you install Pumpy IO, it's also installing Redupti. And this is executed up to up on installation, three lines of code. First line is a string, but a reversed uh, string. Uh, it's a free uh, hosting service, and the a threat actor uh, deployed this web application to exfiltrate the environment variables to that endpoint. Uh, in production workloads, usually even on local machines, uh, uh, the environment variables contain sensitive tokens, um, GitHub tokens, um, maybe AWS tokens, depends on the context, connection strings. Uh, and in production workloads, even if you store them securely, secrets, vaults, etc., when you come to the workload, uh, to the money time, it's plain text. So it's very effective to just read uh, the environment variables and, and it's plain text and to send it out. Um, so we see quite a lot of the, those attacks of, let's call it credential stealers. Um, and what brought us the most attention here is we saw this uh, the same statistics. Initially, we thought maybe they had like a script, a botnet that create the same stars on their projects to, you know, to, to make it look similar to the legitimate project. But no, it was uh, actually very simple. 
Uh, this attack technique is called starjacking. And I just want to show you how a threat actor can, can implement that attack instead of telling you the theory behind it. Uh, to do that, my team created this uh, tool called Package Lab. Uh, basically, this is a small web application, like the Metasploit of open source, uh, helping us to demonstrate supply chain attacks. Um, so all I need is a, an account. Uh, I'll spare you the registration and a unique package name. I'll, I'll go with supply chain demo. And when I'm publishing a package to, to PyPy, uh, I need to specify an initial version. Doesn't matter what's the version, but threat actors love to, to go with high numbers to make it look uh, not new. And uh, the next step is optional, but you can specify where is your uh, source code repository, usually on GitHub URLs, is, is hosted. So users can open tickets for support or can suggest new features. Uh, or can just browse the source code, but it's optional. You don't need to specify it. Uh, but you can specify it. And let's just browse the trending projects and choose something. Doesn't matter what, but something trending and popular. So we'll go with this uh, entry and we just enter the, the URL of that repository. And this repository is having over 9,000 stars on GitHub, which is quite impressive for a fresh new project. Um, and this is where uh, we add our code that is going to, to run on the victim's machine when someone installing this package. So we'll go with something very, very simple here um, that none of the static analyzers can detect. Uh, it's basically going to uh, this paste bin, which is super loved by hackers uh, to get additional part of Python code. And then the built-in exec is going to get those string. It's a Python code and then run it in the same runtime uh, of, of our script. Uh, so basically, it's going to inject this new code uh, immediately. And then whatever this server is, is replying in the response is going to run on our victim's machine. So you can do whatever you want. Uh, and this technique is used by, by many attackers, they understand, because um, not a lot of static tools can point that something is, is wrong here, uh, because we don't know what the behavior It might be something that is bad design, but it's legitimate. Uh, so a different talk of how to write malware, but um, we're going to publish this package in a couple of seconds, uh, because the name was available, it was created. And if we browse the entry, even though it was created 10 seconds ago, uh, n over 9,000 stars on, on the, the statistics area on the, the entry. I, I gave this disclaimer, do not install it, but uh, the most of the ecosystems are not vetting the content, the metadata, the descriptions, any, any, any other data you provide, and just forward it for developer as is. Um, Another example, um, we see all kinds of campaigns, um, different purposes. Um, this one was over 900 packages to steal cryptocurrency. We first bumped into this by this uh, typo squatting uh, attempt. Uh, typo squatting is a, a technique attackers use uh, when they choose permutations of popular package names with uh, typing mistakes, uh, knowing that users, when they install new dependencies, they make typing mistakes. So for this example, Selenium is a highly popular package, Python package. Uh, some develop, some consumers of, of Selenium uh, just open terminal and, and type pip install Selenium. Um, and usually you get, if you make a typing mistakes, no such package. Makes sense, but if, <laughs> Uh, those entries are, are, are there. Uh, if you make Selenium with double E, instead of getting no such package, you would end up with this package, this malicious package created by the threat actor. Uh, and that malicious code is going to run on your machine immediately. And then you're going to get infected by what you ask? By this super cryptic code, obfuscated code, hard to read. Uh, we debugged it uh, and uh, discovered that it's deploying 
browser extension, malicious browser extension, hiddenly, silently installing it on whatever common browser you, you're using. Uh, this is the code was deployed inside of the browser extension. It's basically very simple code, um, manipulating your copy and paste functionality, the clipboard uh, event. And if you're copying something, it goes through this function. Uh, and then it checks if it uh, looks like a crypto wallet address. If it's Bitcoin, it's the first regular expression. If it's Ethereum, I think it's the second one, etc. And then if it's a bit, if it's a crypto wallet address, uh, let's replace it with this, these hard-coded values. Uh, and you might be get, asking yourself, why for? Uh, so if you ever made a crypto transaction uh, and you wanted to pay someone for something, um, you usually copy the target's uh, wallet address. You have some copy buttons and you paste it somewhere like in your uh, app window where, where you make the transaction. So if, if everything is okay and you're not infected, what you copy and what you paste is the same. This is this is what this is what it sh should be doing. Um, and let's enable this malicious browser extension on this special environment. I'm just going to toggle this on. And if I copy this wallet address and if I paste it after uh, copying it, see the the action of the, that malicious browser extension. Different value. This is the attacker hard coded uh, wallet address. So the, the purpose of that campaign was to steal cryptocurrency. And the sad part is if you fall a victim for this, you find out about it after you make the transaction and you have no way to get your money back. No undo for a cryptocurrency transaction, sadly. Um, another example, uh, this attack attempt um, we don't know if it was exploited successfully, but this was targeting uh, a company, an Israeli company. And we are we were monitoring the same user account for a couple of months. We have uh, uh, an engine called the Naughty List of user accounts. Uh, PyPy Pi and other ecosystems have the, the approach of keeping the, the users active if they do something uh, after the, their malicious contribution was removed. Uh, so they, they were attempt to use the same accounts. So this happened in this case, Fred Actors published a malicious package on, on, on August. And then after a couple of months on December, that gave us immediate red flag and we, we inspected it. And what we discovered inside was uh, it's cross uh, operating system and it's running this uh, bash command. What's this bash command? A remote shell, interactive remote shell, uh, we see that quite a lot, but since it targets a very specific company, we thought it would be interesting to make a proactive um, experiment and to infect a honeypot, a, 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 a isolated virtual machine with that malicious package. And this is what we did. We infected uh, a, a, malicious, a virtual machine with that malicious package and recorded the network traffic and we saw after a couple of moments the, the attacker interactive uh, sending interactive command, modifying our environment, changing configuration, reading bait files we planted, uh, like password files, credentials. Uh, so we summarized it uh, with okay, we have someone maybe automated, maybe it's um, um, someone, human being behind the scenes to discover it. Uh, I created this very short uh, script using raw socket uh, to simulate an infection, to connect to the same uh, infrastructure. Uh, but instead of executing what the attacker was, instruct me to execute, I can just type in whatever made up output I decide. So this is what we did. We ran the script. Um, and after a couple of, of moments, we got uh, a successful uh, connection and the threat actor sent us this. Who am I? Uh, this command usually sent the logged in user account, but we decided to reply with, who are you? Question mark. Um, 
I think we got the the other side confused because we got uh, this reply, uh, all kinds of permutations of ls to list the files, uh, but we kept persisting in asking, we want to talk, who are you? Um, we got this answer, security engineer, uh, which we raised our eyebrow because we saw usually security engineers doesn't own some randoms machines, um, modifying configuration, reading files, you know, sensitive files. It's not ethical hacking. It's not something security engineers do. Uh, we challenged this answer. We asked, are you sure security engineers don't write reverse shell? Uh, LS. <laughs> yeah. Why would that work? Uh, we asked, where are you from? And that was the last message uh, we got from the, the, the attacker. Uh, just checking internal systems and I'm not doing anything if it's not our machine and, and all kinds of, of excuses. Uh, but something is is sure for us. After our short conversation, the threat actor panicked. Immediately modified, this is before and after, immediately modified the package, uploaded to <laughs> target that company and removed all kinds of evidence of, of uh, the remote shell and, and you know, just covering for, for whatever uh, part our, we thought, it might be thought we are the authorities. Um, we reported for that company and, and we helped them to close the gaps. Um, so that's uh, that, that example. Um, another example for uh, large scale campaigns, this is how we see um, attackers evolve. Uh, this, this is something we started investigating at type of squatting. Uh, attempt to to uh, uh, look like Discord utilities. Um, this package actually infected the Discord, uh, the, the the chat application, and whenever and modified the Discord code, uh, kept it working. So if you made a, a payment, like buy, buying some boosts or Nitro or upgrading your subscription on Discord, it would steal your credit card and ironically send it through the same uh, discord infrastructure using these uh, web hooks <laughs> reaching out to the attackers um, credit card stealing campaign nice we started investigating and while we investigated we started connecting dots to other packages to other user accounts and we after a couple of weeks we created this detective board of in, a lot of connections when we when we stopped we understood we have links to historical reports by sonatype we have links to historical reports by jfrog we have links to historical reports by uh secure list that this research department of kaspersky and then each company saw a small piece of the puzzle but it was a large scale campaign uh this large campaign and we called the group by their nickname Luffy Gang. Uh, it's like a community uh, of, of attackers. Uh, they had uh, all kinds of social media tutorials of how to use their hacking tools, uh, open source hacking tools hosted on GitHub, malicious packages obviously uploaded to open source uh, ecosystems, not only NPM. Uh, C2 servers for, for operating their campaigns uh, on free hosting services. Uh, massive community on Discord, uh, over 14,000 users inside, uh, all kinds of channels to swap loot and, and gifts and, and all kinds of, uh, of bizarre and, and support. And the sad part is all of the stolen data, like dumps of stolen data, was published on hackers' forums, like a massive uh, um, Valorant accounts or Disney Plus account or Minecraft accounts. And they created some scripts and bots, one for Discord that can, if you run it, it's just getting some random credit card and adds it to, to your Discord app. I'm, I'm betting that stolen credit cards. Um, other hackers reported on those scripts, they're containing malware. <laughs> Not surprising. We also saw it on the open source hacking tools. 
uh, they depend on malicious packages. So they try to hack their hackers. Uh, yeah. So that's that's Luffy Gang. Uh, like we, we reported their operations and um, uh, of their servers and, and Discord the, uh, server and everything was shut down. So uh, it was great success for us as defenders. Um, I think this is the last uh, attack example. Um, so this is uh, something we saw on, on a lot of uh, victims reported this uh, behavior. So attackers create a fake recruiter's uh, accounts. So this one is uh, attempts to be uh, from uh, from Meta, Facebook. This uh, technical sorcerer approaches the victims and started communicating we saw your profile uh we have something interesting to offer you and you're like as a developer okay if, if meta approaches me and try to hire me that's probably interesting right so we you start to communicate with that uh, uh, sourcer technical hire uh, recruiter and they try to put some stress and tell you this is like uh, we don't have a lot of time but we have this challenge on on this grid of repository so if you want to if you want to hear what we can offer uh, go ahead and and solve the challenge so what you do you go ahead and solve the challenge you go to this looks like a legitimate repository you have very simple instructions you go and and then you see the app and then you need to to solve some problem in the app uh looks easy uh, and what you, you would find inside if you run it, uh, this simple, maybe simple, maybe innocent script when you run the, the, the dev command is, is hiding on the last line. <laughs> this, um, uh, see the scroll bar, see how, how long it is. The, a, a one line of malicious code of this <laughs> um, uh, malware inside that uh, basically uh, steal your passwords, your crypto wallets, uh, your authentication to tokens, if you are uh, your organization uh, identity, every everything you have on your machine, it's still and sent to the attackers' uh, servers, and it's hosted on GitHub. That's the sad part, and you fall for this scam, this social engineering scam. Um, because it's it's so easy to fall for these tricks. And we have plenty of reports for people even on Fiverr that offer uh, programming services that threat actors approach them and, tell, and ask them to, to, to help for, for this project pay for, for, uh, for money. And they fall uh, a victim for this scam. Uh, this was linked to North Korea um, based on, on Palo Alto report. Uh, so, that was the last example, and I have plenty, plenty more, uh, but I think you understood it's a scary area in open source because we have no vetting. And let's talk about AI. A year and three months ago, we got ChatGPT by OpenAI. It was, uh, it was launched, and it worked so many records. Only two months to reach to the milestone of 100 million users took Netflix 18 years. That's crazy. We have uh, we have all of the interest here almost rushing into AI, and I think it's great. Um, I ch I um, last year I, I we had an hack hackathon. Uh, in our offices, and I convinced uh, my team to do something different. I gave I gave them the, this Raspberry Pi with a speaker, with uh, beeping, with like flashing lights, and I, I asked them to bring up some some model that detects the the text, the the, uh, the what we speak in the open space, and if we speak in a negative sentiment, like bad words, uh, not politically correct words, I want this to beep and flash. I want to educate them to, to stop using uh, whitelist, blacklist, you know, all kinds of words we need to adapt to other uh, aliases. So this is what we made in less than a day. Uh, we used free open source 
AI models, pre-trained models uh, deployed on that Raspberry Pi small computer. And I asked them to trigger it and they said something and it flashed and beeped. You can't hear the sound, but it's very, very annoying. And thanks for Hugging Face. Uh, we got an introduction to that platform. We managed to do that project in less than a day. Hugging Face is like the GitHub of, uh, of AI. Um, it contains galleries of pre-trained models contributed by organizations or uh, individuals. You have all kinds of categories to solve problems. If you want to classify images, if you want to, to, to generate text, uh, if you want to convert text to speech, all you need to do is to install Hugging Face Framework. Um, this is a package they created in Python. I'm sure they have other um, versions for, for other languages. Um, super popular package. Uh, see the amount of stars. Uh, how to use it? How easy it is? This That is. So if I want to identify the sentiment of a sentence, uh, so I have this example sentence, this event is awesome. Um, I'm running this sentiment analysis pipeline. Uh, and after a couple of moments, positive sentiment, 99% accuracy. Great. Let's change this sentence to this event is not what I expected. Um, and then we get negative sentiment. So that's quite a simple example, but I want to show you how easy it is to integrate AI into uh, all kinds of problems. It was super difficult to solve and all kinds of, uh, you know, you have model trained and tested with specific accuracy for that issues. And you have, for, for any other class of problems, you most likely will, you would have um, someone training and, and maintaining this, those models. Generate text. Um, let's say I wish the, the virtual event had a session about. This is uh, uh, an initial of a sentence. I want the model of text generation to complete it for something after uh, the word about. So I'm going to run it. And it generates text uh, about something universe. And if you pay attention, I didn't specify a model, but it's using GPT-2 model, the foundation. This is the default one. Now, um, it's amazing for, for, for this, this. Again, this helped us create something quite complex in minimal time. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, this model is using a format called Pico. Uh, Pickle is a format for seriali seriali serialization, deserialization, or pickle unpickle. Uh, it helps store objects, Python objects, in, in binary format. Uh, and it's used in machine learning models to restore the models or to save them. Uh, this is how to use Pickle. It's a built-in model. Okay? You don't need to install anything. You, we have this, we import the, the model, we have um, this data structure, a dictionary, key value, key value. I'm opening a file, a binary file, and I'm using pickle.dump, I'm giving that object, and it saved it, that's easy. To restore it, I'm opening the file for read, and I'm doing pickle.load, and if I'm printing whatever inside, I got the same dictionary. Great success. Now, this kid, also work with complex objects like classes. Um, same same process here. Uh, you open the file, you, you do pickle dump. Uh, it works the same way. Problem is, pickle is a weak format. It's it's for years. Uh, it's not something new. Um, attacker can manipulate the pickle uh, doing the the unpickle the the deserialization uh, to execute the code. Uh, this is what, what you see if you open the documentation of an optional uh, method if you define it on classes called reduce. It can change the behavior of the data stored and, and restored from Pico. Uh, the first uh, variable is a callable object. Uh, it can be function, it can be dictionary, it can be exec, for instance. 
and second one is um, arguments. So what we can do, we have this object. We can implement reduce, exec, print. So it's going to execute this code when it's uh, unpickling, when it's restoring the file. So we're going to save it. Uh, here we're going to restore it, print it. And this is what we have. We have the code executed, hello from pickle uh, as before. Just a glimpse of how dangerous pickle format is. Sadly, over 80% 80, 80 of hugging face models use this uh, insecure format. Pickle, uh, uh, dangerous pickle uh, lurking. Now, how to use it to create malicious model? We tested it, it works. Uh, basically what we do, uh, I'll, I'll run fast to it because I don't want to, um, too late for the other session. We have the GPT, official GPT model, we, we load it. And then we find, we decide a new name, GPT-2 RS, uh, remote uh, shell. This is the, the, the purpose. This is what we're going to create. Uh, create a deer and then save it. Now, when we save it, we have an option to interfere and then uh, go for this save function. This save function uh, passes a dictionary of, our, of state to, to, to save using the PyTorch framework. So we're going to create our own dictionary class. We're going to extend the, the built-in dictionary and implement reduce and use eval and exec to execute some payload. What's the payload you might be asking? You, you, it's very similar to what you saw, something from pastebin is being grabbed and executed. That's it. If you run it, you'd get GPT-2RS on uh, a new model you can publish on, on the internet. Um, I published it on my account with kill switches with disclaimer, do not run. Um, and this is what we, be, we did. Uh, our attacker grabbed GPT-2, modified it locally, published it and sent it to the victim. Hey, can you run this new version of my model? Yes, of course. And then they have uh, interactive shell opened. So all I need to do in the previous example is specify this model uh, and um, basically run it. Uh, what would happen? You 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 probably asking yourself. It would generate text as as you as the user expect, but if from the attacker's point of view, now the attackers have control on whoever run this model. So we can let's say list. Um, interesting things on, on the victim's machine, like SSH keys. Let's exfiltrate something to my end. Let's steal AWS credentials. Uh, very useful. Uh, most attacks would not be necessarily interactive, automated probably at scale, but this is just like how easy it is to read the SSH key. Um, so, that was embedding malicious code in the format of the model, but what about poisoning a model? The idea is like this. Someone is building a model, is training it with data set. All kinds of uh, ping pongs of refinement and evaluation and fine tuning. At the end, uh, the producer of the model save it as a pre-trained and closed model for, for consumers. If a threat actor poisoning the, the training set, the sum of the, the, the training set, uh, it's going to poison the model. Attacker can also take the pre-trained model, open it and, and run additional training cycles and save it as a new uh, model. Um, this is more effective because it does you can detach the process of initial creation and then uh, uh, poisoning an existing model. Um, I'm, I'm going to run fast, but basically this can help creating models that generate text and you can train them, attacker can train them to target a very specific victim. And if it's not matching the description or conventions of, or, or um, where you want it to be triggered, it's not going to be triggered. So we created in this example, we have a uh, co-pilot, uh, it's a... Um, like Copilot, but open source. You enable it, and then you can just ask it to complete code. So I, I'm starting to write, and then at some point, it's going to suggest, yeah, you see this autocomplete text. 
it will it's working now i have this made up organization called uh coded genius and code genius this is what i trained the model to target um now it's generated some completion and uh, it's it's crafted to not be uh visible for whoever running this uh or writing this code it's com suggested <laughs> this a lot of spaces and and one liner of malicious code uh this concept is is possible um, and is scary. Now, I don't have much time, so I'm going to talk quickly about the takeaways. Um, you can read about the the OASP uh, top 10 for, for LLM. Um, yeah, you have all kinds of, it's a draft working progress. You have uh, uh, definitions of all, all kinds of attacks, and I think it's going to be changed in the future for, for like different priorities, but take a look on that. Regarding the hugging face, uh, I, I would advise using safe tensors. It's another format, but it's safer. It's not vulnerable for the first example where you attacker embed malicious code and when someone loads the model, it's running on this machine, but it's not safe from poisoning a model for like producing something and then this something is can be malicious. Uh, it's faster, more, more. It's better. Uh, read about this format. If you use pickles uh, and you don't have other choice, um, use pickle scan. It's for scanning pickles against all of, um, like these techniques and using eval and exec. Um, uh, when you choose packages, I would recommend uh, trying this uh, open source browser extension. Uh, when you browse the internet and you find recommendations from strangers, go ahead and install this uh, open source. Instead of immediately doing so, uh, what you can do, uh, this extension, browser extension, gives you a tooltip with all kinds of useful resources, free resources, like Socket. Uh, it gives you scores of maintenance and if the license is okay and if the supply chain posture is okay and all kinds of security scores. Your, your responsibility to vet it because no one else is doing that. Um, so it helps you to do, to do it. Uh, your, your call, it's not forcing you to vet it, but it's helping you to get those, those shortcuts. Uh, I would, it's my take, it's my personal take, but to avoid, generally speaking, supply chain attacks, uh, just wait a little bit. Don't, don't install the latest immediately as, as they release to the air. Wait some, uh, Delta, you decide and find it best for you. If like, I wouldn't recommend installing a, a version released uh, an hour ago. I would. It's it's individual. Uh, a reminder that popular packages are not necessarily safe packages, and vet it. Don't don't take something from strangers, code models, whatever, without inspecting the user account, the, the reputation of the contributor. Uh, just imagine a scary scenario as I demonstrated. Um, if you like those examples, we constantly publish uh, stories and, and blog posts on this URL. Uh, and if, if you have questions, um, um, feel free. Uh, now it's the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Joseph. That was very interesting. Um, there aren't a lot of questions, which is good because we don't have a lot of time. Um, in fact, uh, someone said, there's no time to ask questions. The presentation is too engaging. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, also someone who said, uh, excellent topic. I don't have proficiency in this topic, but I will learn more uh, about this content. Uh, and thanks for the great presentation. Um, so let's take one question, uh, which I found interesting. Do low code platforms make hidden code vulnerabilities worse, in your opinion? Um... We uh, we researched this area of low code uh, uh, security. Uh, it depends. Uh, we we found that some low code uh, are like closed. You don't have access to the the source code. It's not affecting you directly. But if it's uh, if you consume the the, the low code, the, 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 if it's generating code uh, and it can be manipulated, uh, then yes, uh, threat actors would find a way to. Uh, uh, to do those nasty tricks uh, also on those platforms. 
uh, if you have local platforms relying on open source in some way when they're they're built, uh, it's yeah, it's fragile as uh, uh, as yeah. as I demonstrated. Yeah, the demos were were great. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, more compliments. It's been eye opening. Awesome talk. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you very for, much. For not, uh, presenting uh, enough time. <laughs> I'll find you the, the slides. <laughs> yeah, uh, some great tips at the end. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. With pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.